Uh, as you are all well aware, the resurrection, the account of the resurrection is in all four of the Gospels. Uh, not only is it in all four of the Gospels, it is in the book of Acts, it is in the book of Romans, it is in the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, it's all throughout the New Testament. And not only is it all throughout the New Testament, it's woven in throughout the Old Testament. It was prophesied approximately 4,000 4, plus years before Christ that he would rise from the dead. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's a pretty good record. You ever realize this? Everything God says comes to pass. I'm going to say more about that here in a little bit. But anyway, I, I, I want to use Matthew's account of the resurrection. And it's not, none, none, of the, none of the accounts, specifically in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, none of the accounts conflict. They all complement each other. And so the Holy Spirit, of course, who was the divine author of the Bible, moved upon those men who walked with Jesus, who saw him, who spent many years with him. Uh, the Holy Spirit moved upon them to bring out just a different aspect, if you will, a different view of it, all giving us a more complete and, and uh, comprehensive and even exhaustive account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I like Matthew's account in this regard, which his given aspect of the resurrection simply states thus. Beginning verse 1, Matthew 28, it reads as follows. Now, after the Sabbath, which, of course, the Sabbath is a Saturday. The Sabbath is not Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. Sabbath is Saturday. Sunday is the first day of the week. That's why Christians... Uh, meet and congregate on Sundays. That's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Do you, you think about that this morning when you got up? Is that approximately 2,000 years ago, a little less than 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ rose from the dead this day, Amen. this given day. Now, after the Sabbath, so Saturday was gone, as the, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. See, everything God does, everything Jesus does, they like to make noise. I would not go to a quiet church. But anyway, God bless them all. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women... Do not be afraid, for I know whom you seek, Jesus, who was, somebody say was, was. crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Yeah. Let's say, I need to say that again because my microphone must have cut out again. Verse 6 says, he is not here, he is risen. Yeah. There we go. There we go. As he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and indeed he has gone before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. There again, there are different aspects of the resurrection. I want to cover four specific aspects of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As I mentioned a few moments ago, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us this, this comprehensive view of the resurrection. Paul, of course, begins to give us even a broader view of the resurrection of Christ. Peter did the same thing in his epistles. But we begin to understand that there are so many aspects of the resurrection of Christ because there are many aspects of Christ himself. You know, he, he's our healer, he's our comforter. He's our counselor, he's our guide, he's our protector. Uh, he has to correct us every now and then. I know you guys are perfect, not, you know, unlike me, uh, but every now and then he's got to correct me every now and then. So he's everything. He's a lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, he's also the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, so it is with God. You know, God, uh, in, in his full-orbed majesty, we begin to understand. If you were to, theologically speaking, dissect uh, the aspects of God, it, it, it would definitely take all eternity. Uh, Paul just kind of summarized it when he referred to it as the manifold wisdom of God, the multifaceted dimension of God. Everything God does, there is so much more to it. Just like you, 
uh, you know, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible declares. Okay, most of you believe that. That's good, and you should. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And, you know, we, we are this divine composite, both spiritually now and naturally, of this wonderful human living organism called a body, right? And there are so many layers to that. And so it is with God in everything he does, as is the resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead, he, of course, made it accessible, made it available, made it possible for people who believe in him to also be raised from, as the Bible says, dead, who were dead in trespass and sin, come alive to life evermore. So when we got born again, that basically is a spiritual, you can call it a phenomenon, you can call it a spiritual epiphany, you can call it a spiritual, definitely a transformation, the Bible calls it, passing from death unto life, okay? So once that occurs, though, there's so much more involved that Christ does in our life. It began, though, with his resurrection, when the Bible refers to in the book of 1 Corinthians that Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection, meaning, of course, he was the first one that rose from the dead with, and to bring life forevermore. Now, there were people uh, all throughout the Old Testament over millenniums that they rose from the dead, too. But they, uh, of course, raised, they, they were raised from the dead from the power of God, but they were not able or capable of bringing life forevermore into the life of people because they were not the son of God. Only Jesus Christ can and will do that and has done that. So the different aspects of the resurrection, I just want to talk about this for a few minutes this morning. I, I, I really think it's going to help you. First of all, it's this. If nothing else, I'll make you happy. Amen. You know, Christmas and Easter should be the happiest days for a child of God. Amen. I mean, really. You know, not Christmas because we get gifts and not Easter because, we, you know, we'll, we'll get a new shirt or a new dress or a new outfit or something. But because the birth, you know, those are the great bookends of the history of the world and the history of heaven. The birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. But if it weren't for the resurrection of Christ, his birth would have been null and void, right? But anyway, here are a few aspects of the resurrection. First, there's the aspect of the certainty of the resurrection. I mean, it had to happen. It had to happen. Notice this, verse 6. Then I'll back up all the way to the book of Genesis here in just a couple of minutes. Notice this, the angels telling the ladies, ladies, God bless you. Do you realize that ladies were there at the tomb first? Yes. Ladies, if you're ever going to show me some love, it would have been right there. <laughs> ladies were at the tomb first. <laughs> the men were in their sweatpants watching ESPN. And crying, saying, oh, what happened? What happened? It all went wrong. The ladies had more faith. Now, men, don't, don't you be looking at me sideways right now. The ladies who followed him had more faith than the men who followed him. Just for what that's worth, okay? Just for what that's worth. But it takes both men and women to build the kingdom, right? The ladies went there first. They saw the empty tomb. Notice what the angel said. He is not here. He is risen. Remember, we were shouting earlier on that. He is not here. He is risen. As he what? Said. There's a certainty of the resurrection. You know why Jesus had to rise from the dead? You know why he had to be raised from the dead on that given day, on that moment? Some would say, well, you know, it was God's plan. Yes, that's true. But see, he had to come out of that grave because he said he was. Because every time God says something, every time the Son of God, Jesus Christ, says something, it has to come to pass. There are no maybes with God. There are, may, there are no mites with God. There are no, well, I, I'll think about it with God. When God says it, he will move heaven and earth to perform his work. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God endures forever. Going all the way back to Genesis, do you, do you realize that Enoch, that Enoch in the book of Genesis prophesied of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? 
Or 4,000 years B.C., he prophesied of the Messiah coming and his resurrection. Noah did. Abraham also did. Prophesied of the coming and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus meant when he said in John chapter 7, that Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he was glad in it. Meaning that Abraham believed that the Son of the living God would come, live, and die, and be raised again on the third day. David more than any other Old Testament prophet prophesied of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isaiah prophesied of the resurrection. Ezekiel, Daniel, just go down the list. They all prophesied. Zechariah prophesied of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So millenniums upon millenniums, God was declaring through prophets, priests, and kings that his son would come and he would die for the sins of the world. And on the third day, he would be raised to life again. For the three and a third approximate years that Jesus Christ was on this earth, he told his disciples again and again and again, he said, listen, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to die on the cross, but the third day, I'm coming out of the grave. They actually forgot until after it happened, they actually forgot, and you know, we're guilty of the same thing. Many times we come on a Sunday, week in and week out, we hear the promises of God or even throughout the the week, we read the word of God or we hear something on Christian television or Christian radio that encourages us and gives us that promise and sometimes 48 hours later we forget about it. 48 hours or 72 hours later, sometimes maybe a little longer, sometimes shorter, we forget about what he said. And this is what I want to remind you. The certainty of the resurrection is coupled with the certainty of God's word. When God speaks it, it has to occur. That is why it is so important to read the word of God. Every promise you read in God's word that you believe and you stand on that promise, it has to come to pass. When God declares, my word will not return unto me void. But when God sends out his word, it has to accomplish in the thing he sent it to do, and it will prosper in the thing that he declared it to prosper in. So whatever you need in your life, there's a certainty of the promise of God coming to pass in your life. Somebody say it's, it's a certain thing. It's a certain thing. You know, we would put it this way. It's a done deal. Look at your neighbor. Say, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. There's also the proof of the resurrection, the proof of the resurrection, which, you know, that's why we are here, because we are living proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, needless to say, throughout the world, throughout this nation, throughout this city, that maybe even people you know, you know, they still say, well, you know, there, there needs to be more proof in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't need any more proof. You're looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every child of God is a mere reflection of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every miracle, every miracle that occurs in your life or in someone else's life is living proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anyone ever prayed about anything and had a prayer answered? Anyone? That's living proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anyone here today who's a born-again child of God, let me just make sure here. I thought so. I thought so. You're living proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because when, when you truly get to know him, he's not this religious figure. He's not this pacifistic person that, you know, just expects you to be a doormat in life. He's not someone that redeems you to be miserable all the days of your life. He rose from the dead in order to give you life and that you may have it more abundantly. To love life, to live life, to enjoy life, to live a victorious life. You know, we say that every Sunday. I want to quantify that we are children of God, right? That, That we're thankful to be a child of God, right? And I quantify it by saying, you know, not, not just to go through the motions, but to just make that declaration because death and life are in the power of the tongue, the word of God declares, is that we say that we are a victorious, yes. blessed, yes. prosperous child of God, highly favored child of God, right? We declare that because Christ has given us that life. That is living proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every time a prayer is answered, it proves that he's alive. 
Every time that someone gets born again, it's proof that he's alive. Every time your heart is healed that has been broken, it's living proof that he's alive. Every time, every time he ministers unto you through the power and the moving of the Holy Spirit, every time he speaks your name and steals a troubled storm in your life, it's living proof that he is alive. Somebody just shout, he's alive, he's alive. Let's look at the aspect of the power of the resurrection for a few minutes. Glad you guys still came. You know, which I've always believed that the local church should be one of the most joy-filled and fun-filled places in the world. You know, especially on Easter. I mean, especially on Resurrection Sunday. I know some Christians don't call it Easter, and I'm with them on that regard, but at the same time, when you mention Easter, most people know what you're talking about, right? So you can use them interchangeably. Bottom line, as long as we know and as long as we're communicating that that is the day that Christ rose from the dead. Look at the power of the resurrection just for a couple of minutes. You know, you know, first of all, understanding that for three days and three nights, Jesus was in. The Bible refers to it as the lower parts of the earth. Other scriptures refer to it as Hades, what we would call hell. Right? Jesus spent three days and three nights in hell in order to uh, destroy, completely destroy the works of Satan and the authority that Satan had ever since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. Did you realize this? Jesus spent three days and nights in hell, so you never have to spend one moment there. He spent three days and three nights in hell, so you don't have to spend a moment there. Not only literally, but also figuratively. That your mind will never be plagued with one moment of hellish, fearful thoughts. That your life will not have the horrors of hell plaguing your life. Jesus went to hell in order to defeat Satan on his own territory. Isn't that wonderful? I, I, I need like eight weeks just to preach on that, but just, I mean, I mean that, that just speaks so much of the power of the resurrection. So three days and three nights, Jesus whooped up on the devil. How, how else do you want me to put it? Stripping Satan of, of, of all of his authority, and Jesus, of course, got all of that authority, power, might, and dominion back, and now has given that unto us. I'll say more about that here in just a moment. I'm going to back up and focus on this. We read this just a moment ago. Two of the first ladies that came to the tomb, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the Bible says. Mary Magdalene, which it's recorded in the other Gospels, when it mentions her name in conjunction with being one of the first ones there, to his tomb on that Sunday that he rose from the dead. It says, of whom Jesus cast out seven demons. Here was a lady who understood the power of the resurrection. See, because even before Jesus did die and rose again, he declared many times that he would die and, and be raised again the third day. And even before that, he even declared that he is the resurrection and the life. And that's bold, isn't it? Even before he was resurrected, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he, she, they live. Amen. So we, we, we begin to see Jesus developing this life, this resurrection power in the life of his followers. One was Mary Magdalene, a lady who was a demon possessed, cast seven demons out of her. A lady whose life was just wrought with hellish activity, mentally, physically, all types of torment imaginable. She had a living hell that she was living. When she came to Jesus Christ, he took care of all that. Amen. Rid her of every single demon. Her life was transformed, was completely changed from that moment forward. She was forever grateful and thankful. She became a key witness of the power, the love, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. So to me, it's only fitting that she was one of the first ones there because she knew of the power of the resurrection, still believed in it by all means. And really today, granted, maybe we didn't have that kind of demonic stronghold in our life, but bottom line, when Jesus came into our life, he cleaned house for us, didn't he? 
For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.